The attack, we later agreed, occurred at Madame Ackerman's 43rd birthday party. The evening was typical for late October. Icebox air, onyx sky, white mountains lumped darkly in the distance and peripherally visible as a more opaque variety of night. Because I knew that Madame Ackerman's A-frame would be underheated, I wore a wool jumper and wool tights and a pair of silver riding boots purchased from the Nepalese import store run by an aging wasp hippie. Hers was one of seven businesses in the town of East Warwick, New Hampshire, a town that existed in the minds of some to provide basic material support to the faculty and students at the Institute of Integrated Parapsychology, referred to locally and by those in the field as the workshop. That I, Julia Severn, a second year initiate and Madame Ackerman's stenographer, had been invited to her 43rd birthday party was an anomaly that I failed to probe. When I let slip to my stenographic predecessor, Miranda, that I had been asked to Madame Ackerman's for a social occasion, Miranda tried to hide her wounded incredulity by playing with the pearl choker she habitually wore and in apprehensive moments such as these, rolled into her mouth, allowing the pearls to yank on the corners of her lips like a horse's bit. Madame Ackerman observed a firm boundary between her academic and personal lives, Miranda said. By the way, the voice, um, true voice woman wanted me to give Miranda an accent, like, Madame Ackerman observed a firm boundary, like some Southern, and I, I, I can't do that, I can't do that. Miranda said, removing her pearls halfway, wedging them now into the recession above her chin. She was not the kind of professor, Miranda cautioned, straining her necklace's string with her lower jaw until it threatened to snap, to invite an initiate to her house for a social occasion, not even as a volunteer passer of hors d'oeuvres. Miranda's jealousy was understandable. Madame Ackerman's attentions were the prize over which we initiates competed, the reason we'd come to the workshop. To study with her, hopefully, yes, but in more pathetic terms, to partake of her forbidding imperial aura by walking behind her on the many footpaths that vivisectioned the campus quad into slivers of mud or snow or grass. Thus, I reassured Miranda, who, despite the year she'd spent as her stenographer, clearly did not know Madame Ackerman. One of the many admirable qualities Madame Ackerman possessed was that, even as a relentless investigator of past lives, she could permit bygones to be bygones. Yes, she'd selected me from a pool of 35 initiates to be her stenographer, and yes, we'd both immediately come to regret this choice of hers. But after weeks of misunderstandings, deceptions, and hostilities between us, Madame Ackerman was not above extending an olive branch. And so, on the night of October 25th, I donned my silver boots and awash in optimism and specialness, drove to Madame Ackerman's A-frame. As I passed the custodian-lit workshop buildings, their windows flickering behind the spruces, I allowed myself to view the scene from the future perspective of an older self, wrought by nostalgia for this place that I'd yet to leave or miss. In order to prolong my anticipation of what was sure to be a momentous evening, I took the scenic way along the Connecticut River in the moonlight, the water, whisked to a sharp chop by the wind, appeared seized into a treacherous whore of ice. I spied a hunter emerging from an old barn whom I mistook for the shadowy half second before my car beams illuminated him to be wearing the decapitated head of a deer. A bat died against my windshield. And yet, despite these dark portents, I somehow failed to divine as I turned off the river road 
and began the slow ascent to Madame Ackerman's A-frame, that I would never drive along this river again. Or that I would drive along this river again, yes. But I would no longer be the sort of person who wore silver boots to parties and believed that bygones could be bygones. <laughs>